coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. Think about the revelation that's coming out of this. When we, when we placed our faith in Jesus Christ and he gave us the Holy Spirit and our, our past, our fleshly past, was buried in the sea to be remembered no more, when we come up out of that watery grave, we came up with a new identity. We are not Jew, we're not Greek, we're not male, we're not female, we're not slave, we're not free. We are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if you belong to him, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Docker, coming to you from the War Harvest North Sanctuary located in beautiful North Georgia in Blairsville. We're so excited you've joined us today. God has set you up for a tremendous blessing. We're beginning a brand new word. It's entitled Son of David. Why was it so important that Jesus be called Son of David? And why were the Pharisees and the religious leaders threatened by that title when Jesus was called that? There is so much to this. I want you to get out the Word of God. Go with me, and let's hear Son of David. Look there in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. Today the Lord has me ministering on the Word entitled Son of David. It says in verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Here's where we're going. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm just chomping at the bit here. <laughs> there is so much in this word that is going to transform our understanding of who we are as Christians in Christ and, and empower us to be free to serve him without fear. Take note in verse 16, Paul doesn't reference Jesus, which was his earthly name, but he used his Messiah name, Christ. Look at it together. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known what? Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. What does all that mean? These verses are perhaps some of the most significant in the New Testament because they speak directly to both Jesus and our identities and their significance. Paul used Christ here to illustrate that even though the Jews had known the Christ as Jesus, the Son of God, or the Son of Mary and Joseph, he had at this point more than proven who he was, and here's how he proved who he was as the Christ. He fulfilled more than 300 messianic prophecies while he was here on earth. He performed countless ministry uh, miracles. It, the Bible says if all that he had done were recorded in books, the world itself could not contain them. Not to mention, he ascended on the third day as he had foretold he would after his death, burial, and, and crucifixion. He arose on the third day, and after that, he walked among the Jews with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection. Think about this truth. Just as Jesus had to overcome his fleshly identity of being born of a woman and considered to be the son of Joseph, we also have to overcome our fleshly identity once we become born again by the Holy Spirit. This is a big hurdle for Christians to get over our fleshly identity, our past, because people who were with us in our past, after we get born again, they remind us of where we've been. Well, I knew you when. Well, you're just so-and-so. Well, you were born over there. 
And, and, and they can use these things, especially when you aspire to do greatness for God. And these, these little naysayers can get in your ears like gnats and speak doubt and unbelief in your ears and cause you to doubt what God has told you to do. I thank God that Joyce Meyer overcame all the she went through with her own biological father, all the things that she's gone through as a woman to minister the word of God, that she did not listen to man. She did not listen to negativity. She did not listen to her old friends that told her where she used to be and she didn't need to go where she thought she needed to be. She went ahead and did it. And, and to my knowledge, and I have a very close personal friends that are friends with her, she is one of the largest ministries in the world today. In the world, not in America, in the world today. Because she refused to let man identify her. How many times do you let man identify you when Jesus is the one you get your identity from? We are in Christ. And in Christ we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So don't listen to what they say. They don't have your destiny unless you give it to them. Now, although there was a time when the Jews viewed Jesus as the Son of Man, that time had passed because Jesus had watched this. Jesus had both proven who he was in the Spirit and at the same time established his authority as the Christ before he ascended into heaven. Now that we're born again and live in Christ, we regard no one according to their fleshly identity but according to their spiritual identity as new creations in Christ Jesus. Now, as Christians, we must no longer see ourselves as being born of a woman, but, w but who we are now that we've been born again by the Spirit of God. Get that in your spirit. No longer see yourself as a Christian being born of a woman. See yourself. You have been what? Born again by the Spirit of the living God. See yourself as that person now. Amen. Right? Amen. Old things have passed away. We should no longer view our lives based on our fleshly identity, but only based on our spiritual identity in Christ. When we get this revelation in the church, y'all, there is going to be so much liberty and freedom in the Spirit that this world will not be able to contain us. They cannot. They came to T.D. Jakes whenever God moved him from Virginia, Charleston, may have been West Virginia, and, and took him to Dallas, Texas. Out there, the Lord says, I want you to open up the church, the potter's house. After a while, the being there, they came to him and the leaders, and they said, people are asking, says, uh, what, what type of church is this? Is this the Potter's House uh, Church of Christ? Is it uh, Pentecostal Church? Is it Church of God, Assemblies of God? What is it, Pentecostal? What is it? And the Lord says, don't name it. He says, if you, if you name it, they can kill it. He said, it will be called the Potter's House. God gave it its identity. And in one Sunday, listen to this. In one Sunday, there were 1,500 people joined that church, more than all the people he had in the church in West Virginia. God can do amazing, exceedingly, abundantly, above what we can ask or think if we will let him identify and we identify with him and do what he says and call it what he says call it. And not let man call it what it needs to, what they think it needs to be. We need to be pleasing God. Then God can do whatever He wants to, whenever He wants to, and nothing can stop it. It's amazing how much we as Christians allow people to control us when it comes to our destiny and our lives in Christ. Therefore, we should no longer allow our lives to be based as Christians on our fleshly identity. What people say of us, what they think of us, what they tell us to do. Now, if we would identify only in our spiritual identity in Christ, this would cause each of us to do as Jesus did while he was on the earth. We would love 
and serve God with our whole being and love our neighbors as ourselves. That would be the fruit or the end result of what this word God has given me to share with you today. You would love God with all your heart and you would love your neighbors as yourself. As it is, watch this. You let people railroad you. You let them intimidate you. As Christians, I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking about all those that are watching. We let people in this world intimidate us, manipulate us, control us, and then we end up resenting them because we do not have the boldness in Christ to stand up to them. And instead of loving our neighbors, we harbor ill will toward them. But if we were to get set free from allowing man, watch this, if we, allow man, if we would get set free from allowing man to dictate to us who we will be, what we will be, and when we will do what God has told us to do, if we'll get set free from that, we will not harbor ill feelings toward anyone. We will be able to love them freely. Isn't that what it's all about? Yeah. Amen. Now, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 26. We must, from this day forward, Christians, church, we must get our identity from Christ and Christ alone. Why is that? Look at verse 26. I'll give you scripture. Everything I say, I back out of the word of God. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's Bible, y'all. We're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many a, a, of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So you put on Christ whenever you got baptized in Christ, right? Well, what, what does that mean to be in Christ? What does that tell us? Look in verse 28. There is neither Greek or Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all, what? We're all one in Christ Jesus. Think about the revelation that's coming out of this. When we, when we placed our faith in Jesus Christ and he gave us the Holy Spirit and our, our past, our fleshly past, was buried in the sea to be remembered no more, when we come up out of that watery grave, we came up with a new identity. We are not Jew, we're not Greek, we're not male, we're not female, we're not slave, we're not free. We are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if you belong to him, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is so powerful. If we're in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Whatever God promised Abraham, it's ours. Now, if believers everywhere would grasp the power of only living according to our spiritual identity, it would destroy all of the barriers that keep us divided in the body of Christ. Let me say that again because sometimes this, this stuff is it, like syrup. It runs slow. If believers everywhere would grasp the power of only living according to our spiritual identity, are you with me? It would destroy all of the barriers that keep us divided in the body of Christ. Divisions exist in the church because we don't all draw our identity from the Holy Spirit as Scripture commands us. Too many Christians base their identity on gender, ethnicity, belief, race, or some other fleshly view instead of Christ. Well, I go to first church or second church. I go to the white church. I go to the Anglican church. I go to the Catholic church. I'm a male, I'm a female. All this does is it's of the flesh and it creates divisions in the body of Christ because the enemy pits one against the other through jealousy, envy, strife. But in Christ Jesus, we lose all that identity. Let me give you a for instance here. When a, a, a woman and a man get engaged, they go to get married and the minister or judge says I pronounce you husband and wife 
At that moment, traditionally, what we say is, I now pronounce to you Mr. and Mrs. Dockery. Mr. and Mrs. Whatever. She has at that moment lost her old identity. When you lose your old identity, all things are new because you're married to a new husband. Old things have passed away. I, when I came into Christ, I lost my identity because he is the head and I am a part of the body. The body, you don't recognize, you don't identify the people by their body. You identify them by their head. If I am identified with Christ, then I am walking in my right identity. But if I am identified by the body, then I am walking in the flesh. Now, let me give you an example. Whenever Goliath came up against David, Goliath said, you choose among you one man and let him come out and fight me. And if I win, the Jews will serve the, the Philistines. And if your man wins, then the Philistines will serve the Jews, right? So when David got the... Uh, okay from Saul to go ahead and fight uh, Goliath, he went out there and he says, you come to me with a spear and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the host, and he today will deliver you into my hands. Whenever David let go of that sling, that sling, the rock came out of it, entered into the forehead of Goliath and took him down. What did David do? He went out there with the sword of the spirit and cut his head off. When, when we are uh, killed in the flesh, when we die of the flesh, the old man comes off and the new man comes on. We have a new identity because we're under a new head. And in Christ, we have victory. The Israelites did not have to serve the Philistines. We do not have to. This is what's so good. He says, David says of Goliath, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of God? We do not, after the head is removed, the flesh nature, the flesh identity, we no longer have to serve our flesh. We're free to serve the living God. Is this helping you? Now, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, Christians, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. This is where Christians have got to get so serious about their calling that they walk worthy of it. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep, endeav endeavoring what? To keep the what? Unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? Peace. There is what? One body, one Spirit, just as you are all called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Wow. Christians don't have many heavenly fathers. We don't have many Holy Spirits. We have one Father, one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. These all make us up into one body in Christ, though we all be different. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So that does away with our divisions, does it not? Our schisms. It makes us all one. That's such a powerful revelation that God just dropped on us. If we would just simply identify with Christ, there would be unity in the body. Jesus' last prayer before he left is, Father, make them one as you and I are one. Let them also be one in us and us in them. So is the Lord saying, revelation is coming to the body of Christ? And through our identity in Christ, we will become one on the earth finally. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. I want to talk to you a little while about 
the son of David. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is the genealogy of Jesus. And it says here in verse 1, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the what? The son of David, the son of Abraham. Drop down to verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is also called Christ. Matthew traces Jesus' ancestry from Abraham through David and brings it all the way up to uh, Joseph. This shows us that Jesus was a descendant of David through Joseph. Turn with me to Luke chapter 3, 21. Luke 3.21 is also speaking of the genealogy of Jesus. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Now, if you were standing there at the banks of the Jordan and, and you saw Jesus come up out of the water and you saw the heavens open up and the Spirit of God coming down on him in the form of a dove and you hear this voice coming down like Charleston Heston coming out of there, Charles Heston, saying, You are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. Wouldn't you like think something's different about him? He's not your normal rabbi. I mean, somebody up there really likes this guy. Now, Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being he was supposed, you know it's in uh, parentheses, he was supposed the son of Jesse. Now, scholars suggest that Luke's account was based on Jesus' uh, connection or relation to David through his mother Mary. So according to the Bible, both Joseph and Mary were descendants of David. Obviously, the Jews learned this truth about Jesus because they referred to him many times throughout the New Testament in the Gospels to him as being son of David. Turn with me to Matthew 21. We're going to be all over Matthew now, so just hang out there with me, with me for a while. I've got to build something. I can only do it through Scripture. Matthew 21, verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? They're talking about Jesus here. Before that, they're saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they were singing this, all the city there in Jerusalem was moved, and everybody wanted to know, Who's this dude? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, now watch this, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned all the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Wow. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, there it is again, the, the scribes, the chief priest, were indignant. Isn't that interesting? Throughout Jesus' ministry, people were always questioning Jesus as well as others who seem to know him, as to, in this account, trying to find what Jesus' identity really was. Isn't that interesting? Who is this man? How is it that he does these things? How is it the heavens open up and voice comes out saying, this is my beloved son? Who is this guy? Why was there so much controversy surrounding Jesus' identity? Was he the king of the Jews? 
Or was he just the son of Joseph and Mary who happened to be a good prophet, as they just said right here? Why were the chief priests and scribes displeased, indignant, with the good things that Jesus did for the suffering people? He cleared out all the money changers' tables. He ran the thieves out of the temple. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, right? And after he did that, he began healing all that were sick among them. He set things in order in the house of God, did he not? And to this, the, the chief priests and the scribes were indignant. Here he is doing good to the people, healing them, being a shepherd, if you will, to the people of Israel. And the chief priest gets sideways with him. Jesus went about doing good to all. But the religious leaders went about threatening and persecuting him. But for what reason did they do this? It is in this story we read where the Jews called Jesus the son of David. When the leaders, get this, when the leaders heard the Jews calling Jesus son of David, this caused them to become displeased, New King James says, indignant with Jesus. But why? It's just a title. The genealogy has already been traced. People know that he is a descendant of David. So why does it upset these religious leaders, these re religious zealots, if you would, that, he, that the Jews are now beginning to call Jesus son of David? Look there in Matthew 20, verse 29. Well, we're almost out of time, and I hate to cut it short, but there's so much more left in this word. It seems like the Lord just builds line upon line, precept upon precept throughout the sermon. And, and the best is yet to come in part two, so be sure and tune in next week. Before I leave you, I want to encourage you to send in your prayer request and your praise reports. If we've been agreeing with you in prayer, let us know how God has moved in your life on behalf of us agreeing and touching in the Spirit over that thing that you've been asking God for. We know that God answers prayers. We've seen it too many times. And so we know that when we touch and agree, it's going to be done because the Father knows how to hear his children when they cry out to him. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us from them all. We have that hope, and that's why we stand on the word in this sanctuary and agree with you. So if you have any prayer requests, be sure and send those in. The information is at the bottom of the screen. We want to thank you for tuning in today, and we want to also ask you to uh, stand with this ministry as God given us opportunity to go out to more stations. It requires more uh, production cost and time, and so we'd love for you to uh, prayerfully consider sowing into this ministry. All uh, contribution is tax deductible and greatly appreciated. So until we get ready to see you again next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 